namo tassa bhagavato arahato sanma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sanma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sanma sambuddhassa Good morning, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. This morning we will have Dr. Ng Yen Yen to talk about some suttas relating to counseling the ill and the dying. Dr. Ng? Good morning. Today I'm going to talk about counseling of the ill and the dying as according to the suttas. So these are the suttas that I am going to actually uh, talk about and the first one is my own creation so here we must start off before we counsel others we have to use meta to counsel others so here we want to talk about use meta at home so use meta at home this acronym use meta at home before you do counseling, you must have meta. So what is this use? Use here means you must be upright. You must be upright, perfectly upright. That means you must keep your precepts and that you do not deceive anyone. So this is the quality that you must have Okay, before you start counselling another. So it has to be ethical. Then we are going to talk about use. So you have to be simple, sincere, and then sense restraint. You will see that I use many of the qualities here as the Buddha advised in the Karaniya Metta Sutta. So upright, perfectly upright, simple, sincere, honest, humble, sense restraint. Then we have to endeavor. We have to exert. And we must do it with energy to use Metta. When we want to counsel ourselves or another. So what is metta here? Metta here is being mindful. Mindful to use metta. Mindful uh, that you have to put the right effort, effortful. Right effort. Not to cause suffering. To another or yourself and that you have to be kind friendly compassionate joyful at other successes and even minded in other words to use all the Brahma Viharas. We have to use all these Brahma Viharas when we counsel another. Because without that, it will be just lip service. We have to imbibe the Brahma Viharas when we counsel another. This is so to be kind to all beings. So these all beings, the Buddha has said, whatever shape, whatever size, whatever color, whether visible or invisible, whether they are strong or they are weak. So you have to be mindful and effortful to all beings in all directions, all around. 
and then anger free you have to do this then we have to uh, do it at home at home as in uh, in our own homes in our own country in our on our earth this is our home so that when you use meta then home will be harmonious there will be harmony and there will be peace and that you have to do it with open-minded open-mindedness you have to do it and open-heartedness you have to do it and open-handedness So when you do this using Meta, you have to use it with an open mind, with an open heart, with open hands. Then it will be successful. And the M is the middle path. It's the middle noble eightfold path. In other words, you have to use wisdom and you must always keep in mind the Noble Eightfold Path. The right understanding that there's suffering, there's an origin, there's a cessation and there's a path. So that you would have right thoughts as to renounce sense desires, renounce ill will, renounce cruelty to yourself and to others. So you have to use Metta. So meta in speech, action, livelihood, wisdom too, and use the right effort, mindfulness, and concentration. And what is the E? The E is to end suffering. End suffering for oneself and others so that there can be release to bliss. So when you want to do counseling and servicing, we have to use Meta at home. So this is the requirement before you do the counseling. Right. Then we do the counseling. We see how the Buddha are uh, taught in the suttas counseling. So in this particular sutta, Ankutara Nikaya 6.16. When there is in the book of six, there will be six items that the Buddha taught. So Nakula Pittu Sutta. Nakula, Put, Nakula Pitta is the man and Nakula Mata is the lady, his wife. So on one occasion, when they were at home in the Baga country in Crocodile Hill, Likely there are a lot of crocodiles there. Now, anyway, Nakula Pitta was gravely sick. And his wife, Nakula Mata, tend to him. And Nakula Mata tells this to him. He says, do not die with concerns. This is painful. The Buddha criticized about dying with concerns and worries. Do not die with concerns and worries. Then she went about to settle his concerns. And what were his concerns? She thinks that he will be worried about the livelihood. Then she told him, don't worry about the livelihood. I know how to weave and knit. I will be able to support myself and the children. So don't die worrying about this. And then he says, the marriage, because it's the husband and wife, ma. And the wife then tells him, I am not going to remarry 
don't you worry. We have been living a celibate life for the past 16 years as lay husband and wife. How likely am I to marry? I have been celibate, so don't worry about this. Then he says, are you worried that I don't attend to the Buddha and the Sangha after you are gone? Don't worry, I will have more time to attend to the Buddha and the Sangha after you are gone. So don't worry about this. And do you have doubt about my sila, my samadhi and panya? If you are worried, you can ask the Buddha. I have noble sila, samadhi and panya. So don't you worry. So when the husband was being exalted, was being told by this, that the wife tell him not to worry and that settle all his concerns, instead of dying, he became better. He recovered. And so when he had recovered, he went to the Buddha and the Buddha agreed that his wife is truly has noble virtue, serenity and wisdom. That she, out of compassion for him, was able to exhort and instruct him. So this is about a wise and compassionate wife who knew how to sort out the worries of her husband. So similarly, we can look into the concerns and worries of the spouse or any other person who is ill or dying. And we start off with his concerns in the family, in his attachments to his people in the home, or to even to material things or even to the way he wants his funeral to be conducted. So you have to go through all his concerns and then settle it so that he can go at peace. Right. So then these are examples of ways. But we can look into the individual specific needs and we should start the conversation not at the deathbed. We should start the conversation like now, during COVID period, when we are all at home. So this is something for you to think about of what are your, what are your loved ones' concerns and your own concerns too. Okay, now we go so you digest this a bit and then we go to the next one. The next one is still Nakula Pitta and it's still at Crocodile Hill. It's on an, an, another occasion when the Nakula Pitta, he was an old man and then he went to see the Buddha on his staff and then he told the Buddha, I have not come to see the Buddha and the Sangha because I have been ill on many occasions I have been ill from my aging from my aging illnesses I can't come to see the Buddha can the Buddha please advise me what to do about this you know and then the Buddha says, yes, it's true. Old age is dukkha. Old age is suffering. But then he says, the body may be sick, but the mind is not sick. So the body may be sick, but the mind is not sick. So when Nakula Pitta heard this, he was so happy because it is the truth and when you hear the truth it just resonates through your whole being that the body can be sick but the mind not 
So after paying respects to the Buddha, he went to pay respects to Venerable Sariputta. And Venerable Sariputta saw him and says, Hey, Nakula Pitta, your faculties are clear and bright. Have you heard a sermon? Have you heard a discourse from the Buddha? And Nakula Pitta says, Yes, I have heard this talk. And he said that the body may be sick, but the mind not. Then Venerable Sariputta asked him, Do you know the meaning? Oops, Nakula Pitta said, I did not know, I do not know the meaning. And then Venerable Sariputta went on to explain the meaning of this, how the body can be sick, but the mind be not. So this particular sutta is in the Samyutta, Kanda Samyutta of the five aggregates. So we talk about five aggregates as being the body and the mind. And the mind is of feelings, perceptions, thoughts, and consciousness. So he says, Venerable Sariputta says, this body and mind, these five aggregates, are impermanent. And when they are impermanent, it cannot be held to. And so if it cannot be held to, there's no permanent self or soul there. If there's nothing permanent or self there, you don't have to hold on to anything. Just see them as not mine, not I, not self. It is the nature. Do you hold on to sunset? Do you hold on to sunrise? If you hold on to something moving, you only suffer. So you have to free your mind. See that the body is just the elements that changes all the time. Not at any moment that it stands still. It is moving, moving, moving. Like the rest of nature, we are the nature. And it changes all the time. And you cannot cling. If you cling, you have to use a lot of force to stop sunrise and sunset. It's impossible to stop that. You just have to enjoy the sunrise and sunset. Not the beauty, but the changing nature. You have to see the changing nature. That the body, like the elements of the earth that is manifested in sunrise and sunset, in old age and sickness and death, they are just changes going on and on, and they just move. There's no particular personal identity to it. If the mind can see that the body changes and is beyond your control, and you remain detached and look at the changing nature of the body, just as you watch the sunrise and the sunset, then the mind will not be agitated. The mind will be detached. So here we say that these five aggregates, they do not belong to you. You have no control over them. There is some measure of taking care, to take care of the four elements. Because the Buddha says, we have these four poisonous snakes. They are the four elements. You have to feed it, and when it's shit, you have to clean it. And you clean, after that, you have to shower it. And then you have to lift it up and put it on the bed. If you don't take care of these four snakes, it will bite you. So we still have to take care of all these four snakes these four elements. And so these four elements you do take care, but we don't want to 
endanger these four elements so that we can have a life to understand the Dharma. So here it's very important that we see the body just as the body is of the four elements make up of rice and gruel and milk and McDonald and what have you and bubble tea etc. So it's just these elements that is plastered on this skeleton and it will decay and grow no, grow and decay, arise and cease, is, is of its nature. When it comes to a certain age and time, when the elements cannot hold up itself, it will die. That is a prediction. So this prediction that we all die will come true for you and for me and for all the conditions, things in the world. So in this way, he says, these five aggregates, they are not mine, not I, not self. So if you detach, then you will be able to see pain and suffering and uh, aches and whatever you have as just arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing, changing, 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 with no difference as from the sunrise or the sunset. So this, you have to train yourself. Train yourself in the four foundations of mindfulness to see your body, to see your feelings, to see your perceptions and your mind and mind objects as just arising and ceasing. There's nothing permanent or self in them. So just have to let them go. Right. So you think about this. We are of the nature to arise and decay. And there is nothing here and nothing there and nothing in between. So then you free yourself from this fetter of clinging. So this is Samyutta Nigaya 22.1. Then we Go to the next one. Next one is Majima Nigaya 97. I like, I like to buffet you all today. So I give you lots of suttas to reflect on. So this is Dana Jani. And he stays in Rajagaha. And the Buddha was staying in the bamboo groove. So Dhanajani was uh, one of the residents in Rajagaha. And Venerable Sariputta was traveling in the southern hills with a large group of monks. And then when he was visited by a monk from the bamboo groove at Rajagaha, Venerable Sariputta Ask about the well-being of the Buddha. Is he healthy? Is he healthy and strong? And the bhikkhu from there say yes. And then he asks about the Sangha. Are they all healthy and strong? And the bhikkhu said yes. Then he asks about Dana Jani, the Brahmin. And the bhikkhu says, well, he is robbing the king and he's robbing the citizens and that uh, he had remarried, his wife passed away and he married a wife with no faith. And the Venerable Sariputta asked, is he hateful? Is he diligent? And then the bhikkhu says, no, he is not. Then Venerable Sariputta said, Okay, when I go back to Raja Gaha, I will go and look for Dhanajani. So by and by, he, Venerable Sariputta left Southern Hills and went back to Raja Gaha. And after he taken his arms, he went to look for Dhanajani. And Dana Jani 
was milking his cows. And when he saw Venerable Sariputta, he offered Venerable Sariputta the cow's milk. And the Sariputta said, no, I have already taken my alms. I'm going to sit there and then uh, dwell there for a while. When you are ready, you come and look for me. And so Danajani went to look for Venerable Sariputta. After the initial greetings, Venerable Sariputta asked him, Have you been heedful? Have you been diligent? And Danajani said, How can I be diligent? How can I be principled? I have to feed so many people. I have to nourish, I have to feed my parents, my spouse and children, my workers, my relatives and kin. I do ancestor worship. I have to give offerings to the deities. I also have to nourish myself. How to be diligent and heedful? I have to feed this whole kampong, including myself. Then Venerable Sariputta told him, Well, when you are about to die, the warden of hell will come for you because you have done unwholesome things. What do you think? Do you think you can bargain and negotiate with them? So, well, even if all these people, your parents, willing and crying and telling the wardens of hell that you did all these unwholesome deeds just to nourish them, do you think the warden of hell will listen to them? And Dana Jani say, No, the warden of hell will not listen to them. Just as they are willing and making that request, I'll be thrown into the bottomless hell. So, Venerable Sariputta told him, there are right livelihood that you can make a living from without doing unwholesome deeds and yet feed all these people. Isn't it better? And Dana Jani, on this advice, this exhortation from Venerable Sariputta agreed. And he changed his ways to right livelihood. It was said that by and by, Danajani became very sick. And he called for Venerable Sariputta to come to see him, which Venerable Sariputta very kindly consented. And he, Venerable Sariputta, then asked him, how he was. He said he was in terrible pain. His head was hurting, his chest was hurting, his abdomen is hurting, he is feverish and on fire. He says, oh, it's quite intolerable. Then Venerable Sariputta asked him, he says, is the animal realm better? Or the hell realm is better. Then Danajani says, animal realm. Then Sariputta lead him on. Is animal realm better or the ghost realm better? And Danajani says, ghost realm is better. Then, is the human realm better? 
or the ghost realm better than Dhanajani said, human realm. And then went on to the realm of the four great kings, to the Tawatimsa, Tawatimsa, to the Yama, Yama, to Sita, the gods who love creation, who love to create, and the gods who control others, others' creation. So you see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six heavenly realms. Then of course, there come Mara realm. So skip the Mara realm, go to the Brahma realm. So, Venerable Sariputta lead him from one realm to the other. And when they reach the Brahma realm, he then say, and he thought, well, Dhanajani is a Brahmin. He loves to be united with the Brahmas. I shall teach him how to be united with the Brahma. And then he says, have loving kindness in one quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, above and around, radiate your loving kindness. Then he went on to talk about compassion, radiating them, compassion in the same way, around, above, below. Similarly, for sympathetic joy and the uh, upeka equanimity. So when he has settled Ranajani in the lower world of the Brahmas, he left. And then uh, he went to approach the Buddha. And then the Buddha asked him, why didn't you complete the job when there is more to be done? So you can hear this little subtle admonition from the Buddha. And Venerable Sariputta replied the Buddha, I thought this Brahmins like to be united with Brahma. But it is very clear that the Buddha would like all beings to complete their journey. And so we reflect about Dana Jani, that we have a choice to walk the right way, to have a right livelihood. We do not do the wholesome deeds and we do the wrong deeds, unwholesome. All actions will be borne by yourself. If we do heavy work, heavy, unwholesome work, then we will be like a stone. When we die, we just go into the lake and just sink as deep as the burden that you, this unwholesomeness that has been done. And so when you lift yourself up and do all the wholesome things, then you see even Dana Jani can be take rebirth in the Brahma realms. And even the Buddha chide Sariputta for not completing the journey. When he had very little, he had already gone to the Brahma. And then we know that the Buddha had led his father, his own father, you know, and the father became an arahan at deathbed. So here we know that 
If you have done wrong, it's still redeemable. You have to change over and that to practice the spiritual path. So this is Dana Jani. So then we come to my favorite, 55.54, ill. Because this is how the Buddha taught how this counseling for the dying should be done. So in the Kapilavatu, Kapilavatu, in the second country, the monks were sewing a rope for the Buddha because after the rains retreat, the Buddha will leave and wander off. So Mahanama, the Sakyan, heard about this and he went to approach the Buddha. He asked the Buddha, you are be leaving soon, but I would like to hear your instructions. What would a wise lay follower of the Buddha, how would a wise lay follower advise another wise lay follower who is dying? And the Buddha says, you have to establish and make this person's mind at ease with four consolations. Four consolations. And what are they? The first is that you have to settle his mind that he has confidence in the Buddha in the Dharma and in the Sangha and that his precepts that the person kept was impeccable. That he has confidence. When you have confidence, do you have confidence in the Buddha? Then you say, yes, I have confidence in the Buddha's enlightenment. Wow, you're happy already. Second, do you have confidence in the Dharma? Yes, I have confidence in the Dharma. Then he says, do you have confidence in the Noble Sangha? Yes, I have confidence in the Noble Sangha. And then do you have confidence in your own precepts that you have kept to your precepts? So you have confidence. What is the past is the past. Now. You see, like Dana Jani, now he has kept, he has changed, he has turned to the wholesomeness and his virtues are then impeccable that the noble ones praise. So when you have established the person in the four constellations, one, two, three, four, then you ask him further. He says, are you worried? Are you worried about your parents? Are you worried about your parents? Then he says, I am worried about my parents. Then you see how the Buddha advised Mahanama to say, and he advised it, huh? when he say this, it is done with metta. He says, then if he is worried about his parents, his mother and father, then he will say to him, you are of the nature to die. Whether or not you are worried about your parents, you will die anyway. So please abandon your worry for your parents. When he say he has abandoned the worry and anxiety for his parents, then you ask him, 
Are you anxious and worried about your spouse and children? And for that matter, for whoever you are concerned with, your siblings or you know, certain people you are concerned with, your loved ones, you are of a nature to die. Whether you are worried about your loved ones, you will die anyway. If you are going to die anyway, please abandon your worry for your loved ones. And after he has abandoned his worries, and anxiety for his loved ones. The Buddha then asked him, are you anxious about your five, the five causes of human pleasures? Then he says, he is. He's anxious about the five causes of sense pleasures. Then he said the same thing. You are of nature to die. Whether you worry about this, you're going to die. But he says, you see how he led him there. But I tell you, he says, the Buddha said, these human pleasures are just so-so. He says, the celestials Pleasures are more divine. So then abandon your human pleasures. So similarly to Sariputta, he lived, he led, say he taught the way he taught. Then he says, abandon that human pleasures because the celestial Pleasures are more divine, are more subtle, are more enjoyable. So the mind elevates. Then he says, Tavatimsa is more divine than the realm of the four great kings. And so he leads from Tavatimsa to Yama to Tusita to gods who create Love creation, creating things, and then gods who control other creations. So similarly, he lead the person on to the higher heavenly realms. And then he went to the Brahma world. And in the Brahma world of the immeasurable Brahma, where you have loving kindness, you have compassion, you have a uh, sympathetic joy and equanimity or even-mindedness, where then it is immeasurable, he then says, but this, or all these are impermanent. They are impermanent and of the identity of self. You must have a self to want to go to this. And so he says, abandon that and use and direct your mind to cessation. Cessation of self. And the Pali word is Sakaya Niroda. Direct your mind to the cessation of self. And when the wise lay person says, I have directed my mind to the cessation of self, then the Buddha says, this liberation of the mind of this wise lay person is no different from the liberation of a bhikkhu. The liberation of a lay person 
and of a bhikkhu is the same. And so he says here, this sutta says here that wisdom is rope blind. The understanding of the Dharma does not depend on age or gender or sex or ropes. And the mind can be liberated. So here we have four suttas. So I summarize them again. I summarize them. First, you must, when you do counseling, you must have metta. And these are the requirements. You must use and apply metta. Right? You have to be upright, you have to be simple, you have to be sincere, sense, restrained. You must endeavor. You must be mindful of metta. You must use effort to use metta to do, to be kind, friendly, compassionate, joyful, even minded. To all beings all around, anger free. And that harmony, peace, open mindedness, open heartedness, open handedness. The middle noble eightfold path is the wisdom so that you can end suffering and release. And for this loved one, you have to look into the person's concerns and settle them so that he can be at peace. He or she can be at peace. Then you consider your own body and mind, that your mind can be not sick even though your body is. Because it's the nature to be of the body, of the elements, to be changing and that do not grieve when it changes. And then here we have Dana Jani, who for a time led an unwholesome wrong livelihood. Yet he changed. And when he changed, he can also practice and then he was led to the higher realms. And the Buddha says, how to advise a wise lay person similarly to settle them in the four confidences. So you have these four confidences and then similarly you can lead the beings uh, higher, higher, highest and then say that this also has an identity. Lose that identity view so that this cease the identity view so with cessation there is perfect bliss. So this is the four suttas I'd like to share with you all. You all can ask questions now if you have thank, any. Thank you Dr. Ng. We have two questions here at the moment. One is uh, Dr. Ng, you mentioned sense restraint as part of our practice, but here we find that a lot of times Buddhist friends bond over food. Even when we are sitting together to eat, our conversation turns to where there is better chai tao kui, where the queue is very long, or where it's, where, where it's very good. We are also obsessed about going to this Buddhist place or that Buddhist place. How do we become good Buddhist friends to encourage each other in sense restraint when we are always thinking of these uh, mundane things? Okay, sense restraint is that uh, our five senses and of our, our mind. We with advising or we want to restrain ourselves from indulging. So the importance here is do not indulge. So the Buddha will say eat in moderation, not excessively. If your mind is so preoccupied with food all the time, then it becomes very dukkha when you cannot indulge. 
when you have uh, safe distancing, like now, is it difficult? So, you see, you must be able to understand that uh, to be secluded or restrained in your senses is have to be effortful. The Buddha approved of seclusion or safe distancing because when you do not go out to your six sense objects, then you can go inwards. When you go inwards, then you can awake. Otherwise, you will be so, you know, distracted by the indulgences. So, you have to be very clear in your mind, what is your goal? Is your goal the pleasure of the five senses or your goal is to end suffering? So, if your goal is to end suffering, if your vision is to end suffering, and that to restrain from yourself, from your senses, from the sense indulgences, and that to be moderate, to just have the basics requirements to sustain this body is enough. And the Buddha says, uh, when we eat, we must see or we must be mindful of death. We must be mindful of death in one sorrow. That means arising and ceasing of the sorrow. You must be able to see mindfulness of death not only in one breath but in one swallow. You must be able to see mindfulness of death not only in one breath but in one swallow. So, but if you are so distracted with talking and eating and enjoying, that is that joy that you have from eating is not, no, it is of the lower realms. He says that you can, if you see the cessation of breathing or swallowing and be very mindful of death, then you will be able to understand cessation. But if you're so busy indulging, how to see the cessation? You can see impermanence, but you must also see the four steps in the Dharma, Anicca, Viraga, Niroda, Patine Sego. These are the four steps do not be satisfied with just impermanence. Lower, just seeing impermanence and not seeing uh, the indulgence can lead you off the track. So everything must be middle. So it depends on the practice that you have. Whether you practice noble silence and mindfulness or you are during that time when you are together, you are connecting. So you must be very clear what you are doing. Are you connecting over the food? So you, you then put aside the food and you are connecting. So you are doing two things at one time. And when you are doing two things at one time, you are not savouring the food. Neither are you savouring the connection. So you can only appreciate one thing at a time, fully. So it is all about practice and this seclusion and safe distancing is a good time to practice and to enjoy solitude.
Thank you, Doctor. How to counsel the ill and the dying if the person has Alzheimer's or dementia and cannot really understand what we are saying? Sometimes uh, we don't have to have IQ. We need EQ. Animals have EQ. We don't have to have the person respond to you having an intelligent conversation. When a person is demented, that person, depending on the stages of dementia, you can still connect with that person on the emotional level. The person will be able to feel the love and attention. This love and attention, you will then have to use it to guide this person to refocus. So if he refocus how? Refocus on something they love, that they have done before in their earlier life. If they have gone to pray, use the beads, just using the beat again and again. That would refocus them. The concentration faculty can be retrained and the person can be calmer. So even the state of dementia can be uh, reduced. Even if you have this illness, this is sometimes the nature of strokes, etc. But there are some basic things uh, that we are still very mindful of, of our breath, of our eating, of our caring for ourselves. So this mindfulness of the body, feelings, mind, thoughts, if you practice it, we practice the essential. Do not abandon them just because they have dementia. You have to bring up your skill. So in the Metta Sutta, he says, skill in doing good. You have to be creative in bringing up the joy, the happiness, and don't stress the person out. You should be the competent cook in seeing what will make that person happy or what will stress the person out. So if you are the competent cook, you will give the proper dish to the person. So there is always hope because all things are impermanent. You have to put in the effort. You cannot be sort of a loose heart because they do understand love. Thank you, Dr. Ng. There's one question on what if the ill and dying does not have too much of those concerns that you mentioned in the Sutta uh, Anguttara Nikaya 6.16, but the only thing that occupies his mind is fear of dying and leaving the world. How can we counsel him? Leaving the world, eh? leaving in the world, leaving the world, dying, or, or yeah. fear of dying. Okay, fear of dying. So fear of dying, so this fear of dying has to be overcome earlier in life rather than later in life. But if there is fear in dying for that person, then that mind state has to be changed. That mind object that is of fear of dying, if it is too intense, has to be replaced by another. So if the person is very fearful, you have to break the fear by replacing it with something that uh, is something that he can be distracted to hear. So it's like you know, if there is a very fearful thing, then you must like 
distract the person with something that is distractible. So it's like, for example, chanting. So it's a very fearful, so you can have chanting. If the sound can penetrate, and if this chanting is associated with like power, with uh, if it's old practice, with something that his perception of chanting is. So you must choose something that can replace the fear in a, in, in a way that you know how to. So, so this is like replacing the fear with another more wholesome. So the Buddha has taught us in the Majjhima Nikaya number 20. Majjhima Nikaya 20, removal of distracting thoughts. It's the same thing. Fear comes from a thought, a thought of a uh, dying. So the Buddha has taught five ways of how to remove distracting thoughts. So he taught W-I-S-E-D. That means you replace the wholesome thought. Eh? Use the wholesome thought to replace unwholesome thought. So to me, I suggest you have to find out what he does wholesome. And then you must make it very loud so he can hear. You have done so much good work. What are you afraid? You are, you are bound to go to the heavens, you know. You are good father, good mother, good uncle, good auntie, good whatever. Say whatever he's good at. And when he acknowledged that he's good at those things, it moved the mind object from fear to another thing, to something wholesome. So you talk about him. So you say you have confidence, you know, you will be okay, right? So wholesome. Or you want something external, wholesome, like chanting, you know, seeing monks, you know, who can you know, offer consolations. So you can bring this wholesomeness to break that fear. Then you may ask him, ignore. No, 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 because it's so intense, ignore this for a while. You are not dying now, you are alive, you are talking to me now. So what are you afraid of? Now there is no fear, you know. So you ignore it for a while. You have to steal the thoughts. You have to steal these thoughts by grounding the person on the body. On the body means do activities. Activities that he can do and appreciate and not be stressed out. So that when he is happy, his mind and his uh, body is then happy. Then you might have to use, keep on the effort to do it. Move him away from the fear. Then you, you know the danger of dying in fear. Dying in fear, you just drop. So it is good to abandon fear. You tell us this, no need to be afraid. You have done all the good. So you elevate the person's mind. So you nourish the person physically with love and attention and assure the person you will be there to support. So there are many ways you have to know that person for yourself. And that dying at the end, we have to learn not to be fearful of dying. We have died many times before. It's just another time. Right? Only we forget. So some people may remember, but this is perception of, of death, of dying, that is going to be painful. So you, the people around him, you know, tell him, 
that you know they are medicine to help for the pain for any symptoms there are medicine to help and the medicine that can help is also spiritual medicine spiritual support it is important to understand that you know the deathless state before you die so when you say so there is all this hype about death and so we say that arising birth and death is the conditions of nature do the tree cry when they die would the animals cry when they die they go away just peacefully the humans also can go away peacefully if they don't cling if they don't cling to the fear that this process of dying uh, can be experienced even before you are dying that there's a rise and cessation a rise and cessation in everything we do and that it is of the same nature it's of the same nature of all conditioned things to arise and die it is their nature so you don't have to fear nature if you fear nature then it is very painful so this person or those people who have not uh no we all have sort of like see cessation in everything in all conditioned things so then when you see it and when there is this pause and there is the release so in mahaparinibbana it says that the buddha passed away into perfect bliss okay so there is there is this fear which is unfounded which is created unnecessarily because not trained to see so you have to do the training to see cessation thank you dr ng hi dr ng how can one counsel oneself when uh, nearing the death bed if there isn't anyone around the best time thank is you. nobody is around kacho ni when people are around right sometimes when nobody is around uh, and the people nobody is gathering sometimes the deities come to gacho so there was a monk not a monk a lay person called chitta and then his relatives think that how come at the end of his life he is mumbling but actually he was telling the deities you no know, the deities tell him come back to be reborn to be a universal monarch and chitta tells them that that is also impermanent and so he was telling the deities that is impermanent also so here we want not to you know uh we don't want to have a last minute cram we don't want to do things at uh, last minute we don't want to die uh, then uh expire uh, and like chalo chalo kyo we have to do it na uh, we have to experience all those things and understand fully the teachings of the buddha before we uh we must be prepared for our final exam right yeah so we should not uh last minute but the buddha also tells us and he tells us that also can be last minute but he doesn't talk about this last minute thing too much because he that you may just be at the last minute and what did he say that uh, he seldom talk about this he says he says you can realized he can realized arahanship or end of the suffering in life early in life or at death or in the interval or on landing or 
effortless after landing or with effort and then seven is that to Akanita world so can you, you the consciousness or the person is aware of cessation early in life at death in the interval before it lands just before it lands you see that oh nothing so it ends and then when it land oops okay take off effortlessly oh landed oh better take off so then with effort shh, must must take off must take off must take off maybe do a few rounds at the at the airport there then akinita interval okay then it goes into the akinita realm the pure abodes non-returner so he said he seldom talk about this because he wants people to see it in life so you can enjoy end of suffering in life and not such a short interval so he says but can be seen in all this time because at that time at the interval time is different from our time time is slower so you can be the, at the interval and then if you still have desire and you land then you say oops this is not what I want then after that no then it may be oh what is this huh? you want to explore then you say oh no 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 then you effortlessly or you gone deep in you descend oh quickly come out with effort you pull yourself out then you know you have sunk in then it's gone into the Akinita world so this is the seven so it should be in the book of Sep, Angudara Nikaya seven book of seven don't know what is the uh, title of this sutta so you must counsel yourself all these uh, suttas uh, are to be remembered are to be remembered in your mind and practiced and you console yourself you must remember the teachings of the Buddha and so you counsel yourself you counsel yourself am I attached to any loved ones so Venerable Sariputta says there's not anyone anywhere I'm attached to and there's not anyone anywhere I will be attached to so you this is not just for another this is for yourself that you are not attached to anyone that you are strong in your noble sila samadhi panya and that you practice to see that the five aggregates are empty and that you will not do unwholesome things you will not do unwholesome things and that you can let go you can go to the higher realms but you know that all these are impermanent and because you want there is a self and this cessation of identity can be seen huh? no need at deathbed it can be seen even in life okay arising ceasing so what is in between nothing after cessation what is there nothing before arising what is there nothing so what is there to be attached to nothing but is nothing really empty it is full like this place uh, is like empty but it's 21% uh, of oxygen so you don't think that it's empty but it's full of bliss end of suffering so this is the teachings that the Buddha have taught us so we have to strive to train ourselves you know for seeing the end of suffering otherwise we will be like a fish out of water struggling struggling in fear you know before our dying days so we have to struggle before then thank you dr Ng, for the insightful sharing you mentioned about the four snakes could you tell <laughs> us more about it four snakes i think is in a particular sutta i cannot remember now offhand 
So the Buddha actually mentioned these four elements that we have. These four elements, he says, uh, is like the four vipers. So elements, in a sense that changes uh, of the elements can kill you. So death can occur because of eight things. So Ankutara Nikaya 8, you can go and look at what are the causes for death. So five causes uh, that are of the elements. It can be an imbalance of the air element, imbalance of the earth element, of the uh, water element, of the fire element, and then of interaction of all these four elements. That makes five already. Then death can be caused by assault. That means somebody kill you. Or it can be an accident. There is a car accident, non-intentional accident. The last is the karma. So there are five out of eight that are of elements. So we are of the nature to be exposed to elements and then imbalanced. So like for example, COVID. So there's an imbalance of the air and they feel breathless, you know. Then sometimes they have this uh, multi-organs. So multi-organs will be the heart, the kidneys. So there is the uh, earth element that's involved. So there may be many multiple elements that are involved. So when there is no air and it's filled with the pneumonic exudates from the lung, then you are in the fluid element the water element, and then when you have fever, then there is the heat element. So it may be something that causes the death. So the person may be very old, so it may not be the COVID, it may be the heart or the diabetes. You know, so it may be the associated conditions. So, but this all the elements are interacting, but there may be one major element that, you no. Know, not the person off. So it may be not enough air and the person has asthmatic and then, you know, he cannot breathe and that when you have this inability to uh, breathe, then all the previous perceptions, you know, all just come out and then the stress is there. So this five out of eight indicates that we are of nature. Anytime these elements can get imbalanced, and so we have to do preventive medicine. That means we want to prevent the illness from coming. So we have all this like safe distancing, masking, and then uh, washing hands. Uh, all this is avoiding evil. Do good. Purify yourself. So it's the same thing. Avoid COVID. Stay home. Meditate. Purify yourself. Don't get stressed out. So you have to practice the Noble Eightfold Path. So it's like using the Metta and all the Brahma Viharas and wisdom to take care of yourself and others in the home on earth. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Someone commented that, that uh, a venerable once mentioned that every one of us die every day when we sleep. Just that when we sleep, we wake up. But when we die, we just do not wake up. So is dying the same as sleeping? So when we say dying, there are certain criteria. The certain criteria is that your heart stops, your brain stops, right? Huh? your respiration stops. So if you sleep, your heart is still beating, your brain is still working, you are still dreaming, you are still breathing, so you are not dead. Right? Your consciousness is there with your dreams, etc. So you are not dead. So you cannot equate uh, sleep to uh, death. It's a, it's a way that you know, adults tell children of, you know, of just saying that granny or grandpa or whoever is just sleeping because he looks 
you know, like sleeping, you know, in the coffin. So it's just children's. It is just to sort of lack, lack. Uh, so it's a way of telling children about uh, about death. You know, because they their minds may not be mature to understand. So this is maybe one of the uh, ways that people used. But certainly, sleep is not uh, death. But that when we sleep, we our consciousness is not with our five senses. Okay, we then retreat, you know, into the depth of our sleep, so that the body can heal up. We don't interfere with the body healing, so that with a good sleep, your body can rejuvenate. So sleep is important, you know. Especially when we are so distracted with our thoughts, and when this distraction comes, you know our body is agitated. So when we sleep, we allow the body to rest and heal. Okay, last question. Thank you, Doctor. Last question here. As a lay person, we are motivated with daily living. living and eking out a living for food, clothes, and shelter. So, his question is, how does one resolve this in terms of Sakaya Ditti, as we are constantly trying to sustain this self, and at the same time keeping in mind the characteristic of Anatta? Okay, so we have to be responsible for our life, on this earth, we have to do the usual things. We have to look after um, all these people. It's a fact that we have to take care of ourselves as well as others. And, and we have to live a balanced life. And a balanced life is that you you still be able in the world to service yourself as well as others while on the path. It is in the world that we service ourselves. It is because we are born in the human realm. The deities, the devas, when they are about to die, they smell. And the other deities, their good devas, their good friends, to tell them, please get rebirth in the human realm. In the human realm, you can hear the Dharma and practice, and then you can realize. So it is important uh, to treasure your human birth. And so in the human birth, you must behave like a human being with responsibilities. You cannot say there is no self, I don't need to do anything. That is a self. That's a selfish self. Not seeing the self is to see the actual characteristics of conditioned things. We have to do our responsibilities. We have to make a living to get nourishment in a right livelihood. But we do not need to kill, to steal, to rob, to have sexual misconduct, to lie or be intoxicated. We can live a middle, simple life with few needs. If you can just, you know, don't sort of like rob the earth. When you rob the earth and tarnish the earth with excessive use for your own greed, then the earth can't sustain. The earth is big enough to sustain the human population. And when we are here, 
we just use uh, minimally recycling our things so that we can share we don't need so much you just eat enough to sustain just have a shelter over your head just have medicine just have some decent clothing it's not hard to achieve if it's, you say it's very hard you don't have to show this form you know you, have, you don't have to spend a lot of money on these four basics you don't need to spend so much on the four basics you will have time to cultivate and develop so there's no excuse there's no excuse it's the same excuse as Dana Jani I need I need I need it's not you need you want so must differentiate between needs and wants you don't need so much is you want so much so we have to be moderate in our needs so we have to make a right living we have to do our responsibilities this we is a conventional we to support this life as long as we can so that we can practice the Dharma till the last breath so that we can be Buddha's disciples so Buddha's disciples means we listen and hear deeply what he has to say that we do not want to take rebirth into suffering again and again in this life when we want a lot of things we take rebirth in the condo in the car in the food or whatever we take rebirth in all those things so we don't want to excessively one just some basics if have have don't have let go so we can then minimize the self how we can practice so all this recycling is good thank you dr mm. to be compassionate we have two last questions that came out um, a quick uh, one Dr. Ng, what would your advice be as a last thought to be kept in one's mind when one is in his or her dying moment? It depends, right? It depends on what your inclination is. And so you have to develop yourself to good inclinations. It also depends on what is your practice so if you have four confidences like the Buddha says then it is heaven words heaven rebirth but if you see that there is impermanence then you see things as they are then it will end as they are so it, you don't have to you, do, you don't uh, create the scenario things will come as they come so when death can come anytime you just enjoy the dying moments just rising ceasing rising ceasing and seize the cessation of the self when the flame goes off it goes off there's no oil no wick anymore so you don't have to say what must what what uh, what word what thought must I have a thought a word that you cling to is a clinging is a mind object so the Buddha says all mind objects arise and cease so no clinging to anything he says not even to the Dharma not even to a Dharma because if you cling to the Dharma it's a view when you have a view you have mental formations 
When you have mental formations, you have a self. So, you have the taints of sensual pleasures, taints of views, taints of becoming, taints of ignorance. So these taints are to be removed during your lifetime. And if it's not at death, because, you know, sometimes when you're lying there and you have a right to lie there because you're dying, uh, then maybe there's time for reflection. But there must be wise reflection. You pay attention on the essential things. So you gather all the Dharma you know and then you see things as they are. The last question. Does Buddhism believe in the end of times or the end of the world as some religions do? The Buddhism, as far as uh, what I understand from the Buddha's teachings, the Buddha says arising and ceasing. So ceasing means the end. So in all worlds, uh, he says, this is our world. This 1.48 meter is your world. And it will end. So we see that this world will end and other worlds will end and the planetary worlds will end too. So he says, arise and cease, arise and cease. If you see arising only, it will be eternalism. If you see cessation only, then it's nihilism. But you must see the middle path, the middle path that you should see. Just a note of thanks from someone. Um, he or she says, many thanks to BF brothers and sisters for coming together during this period to practice on this path. I'm truly grateful to have the conditions to hear this precious Dhamma talk this morning. May all of you and your loved ones continue to be well and happy. May you all be safe and pro be protected. May we never part from the Triple Gem. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So before we end, we would like to dedicate the merits we have acquired to all sentient beings. Eta vata cha am he he sampatam punya sampatam sabe deva anumonantu sabe sampati sidiya eta vata cha am he he sampatam punya sampatam sabe butta anumodantu Sabe sampati sidiya eta vata cha am he hi sampatam punya sampatam sabe satta anumodantu sabe sampati sidiya and now we'll dedicate Let's merits dedicate merits to uh, our departed relatives and friends Idam me nyati dam ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo. Idam me nyati dam ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo. Idam me nyati dam ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo. Closing homage to the Buddha. Arahan Sama Sambuddho Bhagawa Buddham Bhagavantam Aviva Demi Swakato Bhagavata Dhamo Dhamman Namasami Supatipano Bhagavato San Vakasan Ho 
Sangam namami Sadu, 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 sadu.